thank you for attending Worldwide Slot Car Chat. What is this, number eight or number nine? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember anyways. It doesn't matter. We are going to have a Worldwide Slot Car Chat. We've got a couple, at least one or two or more from uh, over in Europe and a bunch of people stateside. Uh, that's what this time frame is for, so that uh, people who are actually fortunate enough to keep uh, still be in a job can attend uh, the meeting in the in the evening of the state's hours. So if you would like to attend a meeting, just keep an eye out for the links that I provide all over the place and click the link and join us. Uh, I am your host, Greg Galb, otherwise known as Mr. Flippant on various forums. Uh, I've been slot car racing in my adulthood for the last 10 plus years, both analog with an analog club and digital with a digital club. Primarily 132nd scale race cars, hard body race cars. Kelly, would you like to give us a quick one? Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kelly Avery. I go by Genie, Genie2369 on the forums. Um, I'm located in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I race primarily 132nd um, digital. Um, I am um, interested in racing pretty much anything. If you have it, I'll, I'll drive it. And uh, I do scale electric digital. All right, thank you, Kelly. And Ron, go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> Ron Neubauer um, from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, go by Rolo Ninth uh, on forums. Uh, I'm a reformed HO slot car junkie. I now use 132nd methadone treatments for uh, <laughs> my addiction. Uh, scale electric uh, digital guy and uh, collector uh, as well. Thank you, Ron. And Alan, would you like to give us a quick one? Now, uh, Al Schwartz, uh, Ekiri Martini on the uh, forums. Uh, been playing with this stuff since about 1958. Uh, Martini, by the way, has nothing to do with the Italian aperitif maker, but was ra ra <clears throat> but rather was a contribution from uh, my apartment mate and Belgian friend uh, back in 58 with a rubber mm -hmm. uh, figure eight scale electric track on the floor. Uh, we named the team after our favorite Friday night tipple. Come on, there we go. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Lloyd, would you like to give us a bio? You can hear me all right? Good to go. Yeah, um, I'm Lloyd. Uh, I go by uh, Lloyd L on most of the forums. Uh, live in England and I have been doing slot cars this time around for about 10 years. Because of limited space I started off looking at HO and couldn't find enough body shells for those so I went on to 143rd and there I've been ever since and rather addicted to it. I've um, at the moment only two layouts, a, race, a wooden race track uh, based on our local track here, Snetterton, and the uh, Little Monty Rally track, which goes up the side of my shed. That's about it for now. Thank you, Lloyd. And Graham, do you want to give us a quick bio? Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Yeah, I used to race back in the 60s in the big eight-lane tracks in Vancouver, 41st Avenue and uh, Fraser Street. Luff probably knows that. You know, but um, now I'm, you know, back into it a dozen years ago, I guess, with plastic track and I just set up when I want and, uh, you know, run some cars around, have a good time, enjoy the hobby. Made a couple of wooden tracks, small wooden ones, and uh, they're fun too. So, so just come on here and see everybody. It's good to see all the names. And I never did make it to Luff's place in Burnaby. You know, all those years, I never got around to getting over there, so it's too bad. Yeah, I feel your pain on that one. I'm, I'm just a few <laughs> hours south of them, so <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm close by. I live in Langley, British Columbia, so <laughs> on the west coast of Canada, so I yeah, never no did excuse. make it there. <laughs> oh, I have no excuse at all. <laughs> well, thank you, Graham. Um, I'll assume that uh, Chris is going to be there to answer questions. And I don't know if Mr. Ray Carthy wants to tell us about himself. He's got his microphone muted. We'll go ahead and have John 
give him give us his slot car related history. Hi everybody. Um, yeah, I guess I started racing, well, racing, playing with slot cars as a youngster when I got my first Eldon set in 69, which actually I found out later was a second hand set my parents saved up and bought for me, which was really kind of cool. Um, kind of missed the clackety clack of that track though. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, let it go for a while until I actually uh, got married. And there, with the resurgence that happened in the 90s, uh, rediscovered it and have been sort of uh, semi-addicted to it since. I have way too many hobbies, uh, but it really dovetailed well because one of my other hobbies was actually racing uh, Formula 2000 cars here in Canada. But don't be too impressed. I'm, I was so good, I paid them. Uh, it was very much, it was very much a hobby, but um, I, uh, and it was through a client of mine, um, Molson Sports and Entertainment, who was at the time the uh, sponsor to the Toronto Indy race. So I got to hang out with a lot of the players guys, uh, including Greg Moore, uh, Pat Carpentier, Alex Tagliani. In fact, Pat gave me one of his racing suits and told me that I had to wear it, which I st still have and worn. And then people felt really badly for me. So I actually have ended up with four suits, two helmets, some Anyway, I, I look great, but you know, I'm slow. Yeah, I, very slow. But it's, it's amazing because, uh, oh, excuse me, I just got to get rid of this telemarketer. Yeah. Uh, there we go, there has gone. Yeah, oh yeah. By the way, that's the business I was in, so it's really easy to do. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, so I started, um, when, when our daughter was born, got into sculpting and casting. And we did that together. And she actually has her own little business that, uh, called Studio 65. You may or may not have heard of it. But she builds, she actually solders better than I do, which I guess isn't saying much, but she actually taught me quite a bit. So she's still doing that on and off, but she's a little too busy. But it's, it's something that everybody here is involved in. And I love casting. And I, I was listening to you guys earlier talking about 3D printing, which I'm kind of jealous of, but I honest, I haven't dipped my toe into that black hole yet. So uh, maybe one day, but I find it easier basically to, to basically sculpt and cast. Um, Anyway, that's, that's, that's me in a nutshell. I've, I've been posting videos. I hope you have been noticing them and, and viewing them. I hope they're you know, half decent anyway and worth watching. And they'll continue to be posted whether anyone watches them or not. So. <laughs> oh, sorry to bl blither on there. Sorry about that. Oh, heck no. That was like a quarter of the time some of us have taken to talk about ourselves. So thank you very much for, for uh, telling us what your history is. Very similar to a lot of us. I'm Sure, if you see some of the previous videos, you'll hear a lot of similar stories. But it's nice to put a face to some of the names that uh, actually respond, which is really kind of cool. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's one of everybody's favorite part about this. Yeah, is getting, wonderful. Looking up names and faces and stuff. Steve's been on before. Steve, do you want to give us a quick bio? Oh, you're still muted. You're muted, Steve. There you go. Got me. Right there now, okay. I've um, been in the hobby for about 15 years. Um, I have a track here. We have a group up here in Minneapolis, Minnesota of uh, between six and nine guys, depending on the week. We run every Thursday night before virus. Um, very involved now in the 3D printing end of it. Um, it's been nice to have that with all this lockdown. Um, all of us are, three of us are up in that 65 and older group. The other guys are younger and they don't care, but but it gives us something to do. So we've built a lot of cars. I think we've, I think I've built 13 Can-Am cars since the 1st of March. <laughs> Our problem is we're running out of files. None of us are great CAD builders. Um, tracks 130 foot Carrera, been working on it for a long time. Um, uniquely, we do run under a handicap system. So we don't just go balls to the wall in the racing. We've kind of set up a, handicap system that's fairly unique so that the slower guys really do have a chance to win. There's always a couple of hot tuners in every group and they seem to dominate. And we've, we've really tried to eliminate that bluntly, you know, and have. Um, I don't know exactly what else to say, you know. <laughs> that's fine. Just a refresher for, for those of us who've, uh, for people who've watched previous episodes. Uh, okay. For people who are new, they get a quick introduction. If you get a quick introduction from somebody and you want to learn more about their 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 slot history, check out some of the older videos. And the first time they're on, they'll they'll usually give a much longer introduction. Uh, now that we've gotten rid of the quickies and John has gone, Luff, would you like to go give us all about yourself? Oh, 
Oh, you just muted yourself. You were good. There you go. Okay. Oh. I'm back. Yeah. Good to go. Uh, I guess uh, I'm Luff Linkert, an old slot racer on the web. Uh, I've been at it for 50 years. I just moved to Vancouver Island, so I haven't been racing, and it's kind of hard to round up new guys with this Wuhan thing. But uh, I got the track built, <laughs> so I'm ready. And it takes you about five minutes to route a track. You're the god <laughs> of routed tracks. You just throw some wood on there and just throw your router on there and buzz and, you know, five My hours favorite part. a completely landscape track. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining us. I'm sure we'll take advantage of your expertise somewhere along the way. Did anybody without a camera but with a microphone want to uh, give us a little bio or introduction or anything? I see Chappie Man on here. Uh, do, 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 do. Phil Mileage, Ray Carthy. If you want to unmute your mic and just say something, that's cool. Oh, there we go. Hey, Phil, that's Phil. Phil, hey, Phil, you've been on here before. Yeah. Hey, gang. Uh, Phil Carpenter, something known as Mileage on the uh, slot forum where I'm at a lot. Actually, I'm upstairs right now, guys, because I'm getting ready to go out and jog. So I'm going to put a, a Bluetooth headset in and get a little run in here in the beginning. But I've been at it on uh, 30-second scale uh, for since about 2015, and uh, I'm kind of a racer collector, uh, but I really enjoy it, really been appreciating these things, and, um, you know, I don't have a lot of building skills and things, and my landscaping is okay, but I could stand to put some effort in instead of a lot of ideas, so that's, that's me. All right. Thanks for chiming in. And we'll probably, yeah. uh, hopefully you can, you can join before the, the two hours are over. I have, I want to circle back on the collection tracking topic with both you and Ron uh, talking, you know, uh, contributing to that topic. I think both of you could offer some interesting information, but Ron, I'll make you wait until Phil is back on so you can have a dual conversation about that topic. So don't nobody let me forget to talk about that. <laughs> okay. So since we've gotten through the introductions, I'll just open the floor. If there's anybody who has a show and tell or a piece of news or something that just was super interesting to them, just say, say, hey, I want to talk about it. Otherwise, I'll start digging into my topic list. Anybody? I'm going to jump in for a minute. All right. Tell us what's going on. Okay. Uh, we, uh, this is just an addendum to the last uh, time's discussion of airbrushing. And uh, this looks like an airbrush, but it's not. It's an eraser. Back in the day, before the advent of CAD, uh, a lot of drawings were done with ink on a plastic uh, coated fabric. And, you know, people make mistakes, so you have to erase it. How do you do that? This is a draftsman eraser. And basically, what it is, it's a little air gun uh, and a little abrasive uh, reservoir at the top, uh, and you use it to erase the ink lines from paper or cloth, as it were. Uh, it also turns out to be a very effective miniature sandblasting apparatus. And it's very good for removing small imperfections, uh, smoothing down areas where you, that you can't get to with uh, sandpaper or a file or you know, removing paint uh, in a very restricted area. Uh, just uh, a comment aside, a variety of grids are available, uh, and it's something that I use routinely because I make a lot of mistakes. That's, that's super cool. I've never seen that. I, I actually studied architecture, but I was after that time, but before CAD. So my racing machine was basically a, um, a, a, like a, a um, a Dremel. <laughs> it was plugged right. in at a button and then it had a long stick of whatever erasing medium and then you just zzz on your on your vellum or tracing or whatever you did. Right. Yeah, that uh, see. A little I'll go back very briefly. Uh, when I think back to my high school days, uh, the, probably the most valuable course that I took was a high school course in drafting. Uh, I spent the rest of my life in a technical pursuit and being able to put down on paper a piece of machinery or something and I need, need needed built was very valuable. 
And to this day, from the standpoint of the proper lettering on those drawings, I still remember the order and direction of strokes for the alphabet in classical drafting. And I never could get my lettering right. Being left-handed and, and taught how to write in Texas when left-handedness was sinful, I uh, never really got good penmanship. <laughs> so I did, a, I did a stint as a um, work study when I was uh, nearing my graduation in college. And uh, the, I basically worked for free for a, an architect in Seattle. And he absolutely hated my lettering. And, and basically, part of my job ended up being practicing my lettering. <laughs> so, yeah, I was not uh, enthused to be an architect at that point. Anyways, enough about me. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to bring up or talk about or ask? Yeah, I just have a <clears throat> little uh, news point, if I may. Sure, Chris. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, I sort of mentioned that there may or may not be a new track opening in the Toronto area. Uh, in fact, there will be a new track opening in the Toronto area. Uh, it's going to be a new commercial venue. Uh, Ernie Mazzetti is opening it. Uh, this will be his third or fourth commercial venue. It's going to have a six-lane polycar track, probably 90 to 100 feet long. And we have managed to get Steve Ogilvie out of retirement. And Steve Ogilvie is going to build probably a five or a six-lane uh, wood track for us. Probably, I'd say, 160 to 180 foot range. It's not going to be a, a, a bank king or anything like that. It's going to be much more of a, a flat track style track. So that should be... All things being equal should be mid-September-ish. Um, having said that, I don't know what attendance is going to be like mid-September-ish. We, you know, we don't know where we're going to be. So um, anyway, um, a new track opening. Awesome. That's great news. And, Ogle, and, a, and a new Ogilvy track is awesome. Great news, too. And yeah, well, he hasn't, he hasn't built a track in, oh, God. I would say eight or nine years anyway, but uh, he managed to uh, managed to talk him out of, uh, you know, coming out of retirement. He's built a lot of tracks for Ernie. Um, he built my home track, uh, my basement track, and uh, so we managed to get him out, uh, out to build another track. So looking forward to that. That's very cool. I look forward to seeing some pictures of it. So thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for sharing that with us. John, I saw you wave your hand earlier. Did you have something you wanted to talk about? Yeah, actually, uh, with everyone having such great tracks, I mean, it's one thing to see photographs of them on forums, but it would be great, for example, to maybe to have a, an episode or two where people take us around, if they could, their track area. That's I was perfect. just going to say that, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. No, well, the, the Canadians think alike, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to. I want to see that Ogilvy track. Yeah. Well, there you go. Like just, just things like that. And another great way also to promote if there is a new track opening to show people what it's like and hopefully get some people out. Good idea. Yeah. Maybe next time I'll join on my tablet or phone or something so I can take everybody into my garage and show you my track. So yeah, I'll I'll put that on the topic list here. Uh, well, I'll I'll try to remember to put that on the topic list. Uh, so unless unless anybody else has anything they want to bring up, I don't see any hands waving at me. Oh, go ahead, Lloyd, and then I'll get to you, Alan. Yeah, just briefly, um, I'm supposed to be having a proxy here on my track in uh, just over a month's time. But we've had to postpone it for now, delay it a little while because of the international postage problem. I just wondered if anybody's got any experience there. Uh, uh, I hear that there's some proxies going on. I assume they're all in country at the moment. Um, I, has anybody got any experience with international postage right now? Is things, are things getting backwards and forwards? I, I have a couple of things that went uh, from here in the States to England and to France over a month ago. And in fact, at the end of April is when I sent those two packages off to their respective countries. 
the one that was sent to the UK only arrived a couple weeks ago. And the one that was sent to France has not yet arrived, but it is still showing very slow movement every, every, about every week or so there's an update to that package. So I, anybody who orders from me outside of the United States, I just say, I have no idea when it's going to get there. We just need to be super, 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 super patient and just wait for it. Anybody else have any international? Yeah, Austra Australia's taken about two months, everything I've gotten from there. England's been about six weeks. That's where I've been. Yeah, I actually ordered something from Pendles, and it only took a, a week or so, maybe a little bit longer that, than normal, but about the same getting from there to here. That would be nice. <laughs> Alan, did you have, have something on that, or you want to give to another topic? Yeah, I'm not, a couple of things. Uh, last time I looked, uh, the USPS is not accepting packages for uh, XUS uh, delivery. Uh, and jumping from that to another topic, uh, something that... Uh, Chris brought up. Uh, I've always thought that a five lane track made a lot of sense uh, because you can run 132nd cars in all five lanes and use three lanes for uh, 124ths. And the last thought on that is as I look at it, you know, from where I am in Baltimore, uh, <clears throat> when everything is working properly, Toronto was within striking distance from me. Uh, it's a two-day drive with a break in the middle. So I'd like to be kept apprised of what's going on up there. <coughs> All right. I'm sure that'll be pretty big news once it actually uh, opens up. So we'll definitely be talking about that. Um, John? I was just going to say thanks, Chris, for letting us know and say hi to Ernie. I will. <laughs> That's perfect. By the, by the way, everybody, I, I know from the last – um, chat. Chris was talking about painting Carrera track with really inexpensive paint. It was because of Chris that our track drives so well. He gave us that advice when we built ours and it does. It works a treat. So thanks again, Chris. And as always, you give some just wonderful, wonderful uh, tips and advice. Thank you. Careful now. You make it to me. And uh, Kelly noted that I might have skipped Ray. Ray, did you want to give us a introduction of any sort? I'll give you a little bit of extra time to unmute if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself. Good timing. I just got back. All right. Walked back into your room and heard me. Uh, yeah, my name is Ray Carthy. I'm located in uh, North Central Florida, just uh, in the Gainesville, Florida area. Uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, one reason I have uh, only a photo up there is because uh, where I'm located, we have very poor bandwidth, so I wouldn't be able to hear or see anybody if I tried to run a video trying to correct that. But anyhow, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, slot car racing uh, with HO cars. If you're familiar with the uh, famous slot car track in Brooklyn, Buzzerama, if you've heard of it, I um, went there several times in my youth and that kind of hooked me but couldn't really afford it at the time and uh, got out of uh, when I went off to college I um, kind of got into real cars and um, got into that pretty heavily I got my uh, got a little car that I modified and I still take to the track very often um, every chance I get and uh, but when my daughter was born about uh, well when she uh, let me just say about Back around 2009, uh, I wanted to hang out with my daughter more, and uh, she was of an age where she could appreciate slot cars. And I actually uh, took out my old HO set, which I kept, and you know, Thunderjet cars. And uh, I took it out one summer, and we played with it, and uh, she really enjoyed it. And so I started looking into some newer stuff, and I saw 132nd scale. Electrics Digital and uh, got into that. And uh, fast forward from 2009 to 2013, that uh, said I got turned into an 8 by 18 <laughs> track in the garage. Um, what's unique, I think, about my track is that it's a combination NASCAR and GT track. You run it counterclockwise and it's a NASCAR track. You run it clockwise and you kind of go into a Daytona-like infield, 
and it is Electrix Digital run by computer. And um, North Central Florida is a slot car desert. <laughs> There's nobody here. Everything is RC. And um, about a year and a half ago, on the forums, I um, saw somebody who posted that they were in Alachua, Florida, which is on the other part of the county. He's located on the other side of the county. And so we communicated through the forums and then by email. And it turns out they were both slot car aficionados. I run Electrics Digital, he runs Ninko Digital. <laughs> so we ran into a bit of a problem there. Um, he's a very interesting guy, very innovative. He actually came up with a way to uh, make uh, Ninko cars DPR and makes Electrics cars accept a Ninko chip on a DPR plug. And so we get together and race every chance we get. And that's been curtailed by the uh, pandemic also. But glad to be here and glad to see all you guys. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for telling us all, all about yourself, Mr. Carthy. And hopefully you can join us with your video working in the future. And uh, now we have Chappie Man on video. Would you like to uh, give us a bio, Mr. Chappie Man? Sure. Can you guys hear me now? Good to go. Uh, my name's Paul. I'm actually one of the racers in Steve's group. But I started back in the 60s. My dad was a racer and I have his old cars and we grew up with a 124th scale marks set in the basement, which still sits down in my basement underneath my now routed home track. Uh, it's the third routed track that I've built. My first one is out in the garage in two pieces. It was a three lane uh, four by 16 that I put together. And then I, when I couldn't uh, keep the cars in the garage anymore, I needed a winter track. So I took a six foot uh, slice of countertop and mounted that to the wall for a little test track that was also routed. And by the way, Formica is a great racing surface as long as you keep it clean. And uh, then I went ahead and routed my current track, which I have posted on the forums. It's about 45 feet, two lanes, copper tape. I did have a four lane art and set for a while back in the 90s. Uh, was a member of a slot car club in Columbus, Ohio when I lived there and raced at Tom Thumb a little bit. Uh, worked at Checkered Flag Raceway up here in Minneapolis back in the early 90s. Uh, they had a 220-foot Euro Engelman, which is in the basement of a hobby shop in St. Paul right now, if it didn't get burned down in the riots two weeks ago. And uh, I do a lot of 3D printing. Steve and I are trying to trade tips and tricks and you know, I'm not retired like he is, so I print a bunch of cars, but I've got a lot of cars that are waiting to be finished. He's built all of his. So uh, he's quite a ways ahead of me in terms of building things, but uh, I'm not a good scenery kind of guy and not a good details sort of guy. I just enjoy building the cars and running them. And it's all, well, not all 132nd. I do have some 124th cars and I routed my track uh, with four inch lane spacing so I can run those also. All right. Thank you for sharing, Paul. And you know, it's not a race. I mean, wait a minute. Yes, it is a race. <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any topics before I grab one from the bin? Looking for hands waving or interjections from microphones? Not seeing any. I'm going to look in the bin here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, uh, somebody just had a kind of a, a suggestion to mention this for people who are new to Carrera uh, and, and how Carrera cars are marketed and work. If you have a, if you bought a Carrera digital car because it's only available as a digital car uh, or you just happen to get a digital instead of analog, but you're an analog guy. Uh, he wants everybody to know that it's really easy to replace the digital chip 
with an analog chip, which is essentially the board that powers the lights and provides the polarity switch on there. Uh, apparently those, those are readily available in Germany, uh, which is no surprise given that Carrera is based there. Uh, but you could probably still find an analog chip if you, if you search on the forums and, and even put up an offer and say, hey, I've got uh, you know, digital chips because there are digital guys out there who bought analog cars who would love to take that analog chip out of there and put a digital chip in there. Um, now you can just unplug the, the leads that go to the chip and from the chip and plug them into each other and just go straight through. So you've got pure analog. And of course the Carrera digital chips also have an analog mode where they will let you run the car on an analog track. But some people like the pure DC power of, of electricity going straight to the motor. So just bypass the chip or, you know, uh, search around and get an analog chip. And you can, if you have to buy the analog chip, maybe 15, 20 bucks or something, but then you can sell the digital chip for 20, 25 bucks or something. So usually you come out on top anyways. So just a little tip there from DVD 3000, or was it DVD 3500 uh, threw in that tip. Did anybody want to talk about Carrera analog versus digital or anything related to that topic before I grab another topic? Apparently I should have kept my chips when I pulled them out. I just tossed them because I'm an analog guy. Oh my God, no. <laughs> Never throw them away. There's always... I was going to say, geez, it's easy. You unplug one in and you plug it back in and you're done. Yeah. It takes yeah. about 30 seconds. But if your car has lights and you want to have the lights, then you got to either, you got to figure out some other way to power the lights if you don't get the light chip. Cause just yeah, true those. enough. So yeah, if you love the lights, the analog cars don't even come with lights anymore. So yeah, one of the guys in our group that uh, races at Steve's house is a uh, big into the lights, and he's put lights into a bunch of his cars. So I, I like lights. I don't. I, I remember that a, a lot of guys having raced Skelectric with the wall warts that have like no power would clip the lights because they believe that that tiny little amount of amperage is going to give them an advantage on the track by not having to power the lights. There might be something to be said about that when the wall warts only got half an amp or whatever, but these days it doesn't really matter. John, did you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'm wondering how many people actually run night races. I don't like night races, but I'm an old man with bad eyes. So <laughs> yeah, my grandson likes to turn the, the lights out periodically and, and run the cars with lights and we tried it once at steve's house briefly but most of us don't have lights in our cars so it's a little bit of a challenge and i know some people some people just do night races because they think it's fun uh alan over at scale racing center does a 24-hour race and that includes a dark period of of the race and so lights are usually required and he turns out the lights but Although I've never been there, I've been there recently after those take place, and there's usually an all there, there's usually a black light or a red light hanging around somewhere that hasn't been taken down yet. So I'm pretty sure they put some kind of visible light in there, but it still feels like a dark, a nighttime thing, so that <laughs> the lights on the cars aren't the only thing that you see. But I know that um, the Oxygen 24 Hours, they I don't believe they have any kind of lights other than the lights on the cars and the lights, there's a few decorative lights around the track um, at the at the main turn points so that they can see where that is relative to their car. And then behind the rostrum, there's, you know, the, the workbenches has have, have small lights, but the gymnasium that it took place in had all the main lights turned off. That would be crazy. You're like 100 feet away from your car <laughs> having to drive it by only the lights and, and that light over there, which is the turn at the end of the Mulsan. <laughs> I mean, you can certainly get away with no lights digital because you just put the car, you just put a car back wherever you want it with oxygen, just put it on a lane. Um, when, you, when you're running on analog, it um, doesn't work so well. So generally the 24 hour races with analog have a little bit of light so the marshals can at least see the lane stickers. Well, I mean, if you don't, oh, you mean, okay, not lights on the cars necessarily, but lights elsewhere on the track for people to yeah, see. Yeah, because I mean, even if you've got headlights, it's it's sometimes hard to see the lane sticker. So there's just enough light. It's it's semi-dark, but it's not, you know. But with digital, you just, you know, 
here's a car, put it on a lane, go. <laughs> and they usually have a designated lane for when a car crashes, they put it yeah. on the outside lane or yeah. the inside yeah. lane or whatever. <clears throat> Definitely an advantage to digital in that. That's, that's one of the running gags when the, when the analog club uh, is at my house and I run like a <coughs> rock or whatever. So somebody will crash and then they'll be putting the car back on and we'll go wrong lane. Yep. <laughs> but it's not, it always gets them because they'll go like, what, what? That's a good joke. Uh, okay, so lights and career cars. It sounds like that topic is more or less handled. I'll grab another one. All right, so somebody wanted to know about everybody's favorite online vendor regarding best prices or service as well as any horror stories that they have that they might want to share. Anybody want to talk about their favorite online vendor? Uh, I'll go again. I don't, I don't, I don't actually have one. Um, that's a bit of a lie. I, I try and spread things around as much as I can. Um, I mean, even the, in the Toronto area, there's, a, there's two or three hobby shops. I go to one exclusively for paint, uh, and then I'll go to another guy for something else and another guy for something else. Um, I don't have any disgusting horror stories. Um, you know, if you're nice to the people and stuff like that, you generally get what you're going to get. Um, I'm not a price shopper. Um, I'm a shopper of what I want to get. So if this guy has nine two steel pinions and that's what I'm after, that's the only place I can go. I pay what they're gonna what they're gonna pay. So I think most of the guys who have been around now and have been around a while, um, there's not many left, and I think all the <clears throat> questionable guys have sort of weeded themselves out of the market right now. But, you know, certainly, um, you know, in the States between Professor Motor and Slot Car Corner and LEB Hobbies and Electric Dreams and PCH Parts, and I'm probably missing a whole bunch. I've never had a big problem with any of them. Um, and in England, I usually buy from Pendle if I'm going, if, if I'm going to, you know, need their stuff. I know Sean very well and a couple of guys there quite well and stuff like that. So, um, you know, can you save 50 cents? Sure you can. Um, but that's not my main motivation for buying slot car parts. So that's my two cents worth. No, I'm very similar. I haven't had any horror stories worth remembering, let alone sharing. Yeah. Uh, I, I try to shop locally you know, to support my local businesses. There used to be a hobby shop right in my town. Not anymore. Yeah. There used to be Fantasy World Hobbies in Tacoma, which I could drive to quite easily. Not anymore. Uh, you know, they've, they've died out slowly, but uh, Alan's Place, 132slotcar.com is his online store. Uh, he's, he's still got a brick and mortar that he sells slot cars out of. So I try to buy what I can there at Alan's. And, you know, he basically, everything's retail price. I'm not you know, spending a lot more to, to get there than somewhere else. But if it's something he doesn't carry for whatever reason, then I'll, I've got no other choice. I, there's no other local place to get it from. So it's like, where, where do I shop? And oddly enough, I almost always end up at Pendles or Top Slots, top slots and Trains because in spite of the shipping, which usually isn't unreasonable at all, the conversion is, is in our favor tremendously i can get cars from there shipped to here for less than buying a lot of cars from here so and like i had i, bought, I just bought a car it only took you know a week and a half or so to get here in the in this you know climate so i'm not complaining so i usually go there you know great prices great service no complaints anywhere anybody got a favorite or horror story to share i don't, go I don't ahead, have Alex. Alan, go ahead. I saw you first, then we'll get to Kelly. Well, uh, I, I tell you, you know, my, my first reaction is you guys don't know how good you got it. Uh, <laughs> when I started in this game um, with my tin plate scale electric set, the only source of parts was, was the UK. Uh, and getting parts in those days uh, involved going to the bank, getting a bank draft, 
putting it in uh, an airmail envelope, sending it off, then waiting for the parts to come and so on and so forth. Uh, so far as U.S. suppliers go, Professor Motor, North Coast uh, Hobbies, uh, and a couple of others, per, you know, uh, electric creams are my sources. Um, outside of that, pendles sometimes. RS slot racing is good for some uh, particularly uh, oddball parts like uh, narrow wheels for the old-fashioned cars that I build, uh, and AB slots for it for uh, some uh, gears and so on and so forth. Not had any problems. Oh, I have to mention uh, Pato's Place in Australia uh, for decals uh, and uh, John Warren in New Zealand, Munter, uh, for bodies. Uh, never had a problem with any one of them. Good to hear. I, I think that's gonna be the norm is <laughs> nobody having any problems. I and like Chris said, if they if they are a problematic dealer, they probably aren't hanging around anymore, if much longer. Uh, Kelly, did you have something you wanted to join in with? Um, yeah, I was. Uh, Alan um, mentioned the one that I was going to mention that uh, that's who I go to for my details, Paddles Place. Um, but as far as anything else, it's I, I shop with whoever. If I see something that I like from Electric Dreams, I buy it from them. If it's uh, slot, uh, slot car corners, I, I buy it from them. It's just, it's whatever my preference is at the time that I'm shopping. So there's really no, fa for me personally, no favorite is just who has what I want at that time. And, 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 and that's what I buy. But me personally, I, I haven't tried any of the other guys as far as details go. Um, decals, I'm sorry, but, uh, Paddle's Place has the best decals as far as I'm concerned out there. Um, some, some 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 other guys may have different places that we can go back and forth, but I'm 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 gonna stick with Paddle's place in Australia. So, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. Kelly, if, if you think uh, Bruce pa Paddle's place are the best decals out there, good. Keep that in mind, and just don't try anywhere else. <laughs> you could try. Uh, I would argue that they're the worst decals out there. Um, that's just, there's all kinds of decal places that make great decals, uh, Indy, Google up Indy Cows. He's, he's in the States and Michael's decals will put to shame Bruce Patterson's decals. I guess we have competition going. <laughs> I, I would agree, Chris. Uh, the Indy Cows are wonderful. I've gotten some very good uh, decals from, uh, uh, Germany, the thing I will say about Bruce is, regardless of how he derives them, uh, he has the range uh, to uh, 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 meet uh, unusual requirements, I think more so than anyone else. But I would agree with you, probably not the best quality decals, uh, but if you're looking for something unusual, uh, he will probably have it. I would agree with that. And, and I've only shopped mm -hmm. his place once because I'm really not much of a, a scratch builder at all, but I had to get some decals at some point. And uh, I remember having a really hard time finding what I was looking for because at least at that time, he wasn't using the real names of things. He Everything had a slightly different name. So you have to know what you're looking for or how to find it. It's, it's, is that the same now? Is it better? Same. Same, yeah. He's trying to avoid lawsuits and cease and desist orders, I assume. Uh, just yes. makes it hard to find things. <laughs> but it was, he's, yeah, I mean, he's got just an S load of, of liveries to choose from. If you're, like Alan said, if you're looking for something, he's probably got it. Anybody Actually, else? Want to? Go ahead, Chris. There's, there's a future topic for some point about licensing. I mean, has anyone actually ever been sued for making two 132nd scale slot cars? Good question. I'll put that on my topic list. Yeah. That's, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, I'll say I've used IndyCals as well, and I found their quality to be great. Um, I have some Pato stuff that, uh, likewise, um, the range and the, the breadth of the offerings are there, but I think quality-wise, uh, I've been more impressed with the IndyCals. 
I was like, Kelly needs to try some Indy Cows. <laughs> There's also a guy, I think his name is Kevin Oz, who does, um, for a lot of older scale extra cars, he does uh, decals so you can uh, change them around and update them. I've, I've got some of their decals, and I've been impressed with them as well. Good deal. Anybody else want to chime in before I grab another topic? Seeing none. How about... Go ahead. I really miss... Um, it's Graham. I really miss Slot Car Corner Canada. They were they were good to me for many years, ordering cars and parts and stuff like that. You know, the duty thing was all figured out already. It was Canadian prices. And um, I understand they probably couldn't make that work anymore because bringing cars up from the States and, you know, there was probably not a lot of profit in there for them, you know, once they were done. But they were... Uh, Mr. Gingrich and stuff there, they were really good suppliers, really good to deal with. You know? Yeah, it, also, it always sucks to lose a place that you relied on and that, yeah. and that gave good price, especially for you Canadians. There's just not that many choices as there is almost anywhere else, even in Australia. It's killer, things, yeah. it's killer to get stuff from the States, as the other Canadian people on here know. It just, it all is pretty much double. You know, if you see something for, Sixty dollars U.S. It's it's going to approach one hundred and twenty by the time it gets here. You know, yeah, it's, it's it's awful. As you know, I'm looking for controllers and stuff, and it's just a lot of money. Eh? I think if you can, you're better off buying um, from the UK uh, because the exchange is a bit better. And don't forget, they sub they subtract all the VAT, the value added tax, when it comes over. So. It is, I mean, if you can find a, you know, a, a car at Electric Dreams, which is not the cheapest guy on the block by any stretch of the imagination, and uh, the same car in the UK, I think you're much better off getting it from the UK. Even shipping, I find, um, if I order stuff from Pendo, I get it generally quite a bit quicker than if I order stuff from Pacific Coast Hobbies or Slot Car Corner or any of the mainstream mm -hmm. musicals. Yeah, I've looked at Pendle slots many times, so mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll have to give them a try sometime for something. Yeah, if you haven't bought anything from them, absolutely give them a try. If, if they have got something you want, definitely don't hesitate to grab it from them. All right, anybody else? Because I got a Whopper that'll, that'll have us talking for a while. Anybody else want to keep talking about shops? Uh, I'll just say one that I've used a lot and had a lot of good experiences with, and I know they're somewhat controversial from what I understand, but MRE over in the UK, I've had a lot of uh, a lot of good transactions with them, and they have some really good prices, especially if you buy uh, a lot throughout the year. Um, they have different tiered pricing, so um, the more you buy, the more you save. I was just going to ask what makes them controversial, and I'm guessing that's the thing that yes. makes them controversial. <laughs> yes. I've never bought, I never, I don't think I've ever heard of MRE, so I'll have to go yeah. look at that just out of curiosity's sake. Can you give us an example of? Um, it's, I forget what the, the threshold is, how much you have to spend. I forget if it's like 250 pounds equivalent or thereof, but, um, you know, you set up an account and it keeps a rolling tabulation and, uh, yeah, I've just found they have a lot of really, um, Good prices and service has been excellent. You can pre-order with them, and uh, they have uh, a good depth of stock too. They have some older stuff that I'm sometimes looking for um, that I can't find elsewhere. It's sold out that that they have, so I always check them. I'm usually late to the party on cars that I end up wanting, so I'll have to check out that yeah. site for the cars that I miss out on because I missed the pre-order or whatever the case may be. So yeah, he's. The, his, it's, the guy who owns that guy is a guy by the name of Gary Cannell. And he was a long, long time British Lock Car Racing Association guy. He's probably known as one of the better, probably one of the best clear plastic body painters and detailers that ever was. Um, he also has a really good uh, range of decals. And because he's been around a long, long time, He's got an affinity for some of the vintage type stuff. So 
you know, if you're doing a rebuild and you need some Cox wheels or some funky stuff, um, he's a pretty good source for that. So a really good guy. Um, he was the editor and producer of a couple of the British slot car magazines for, for quite some time. So um, completely reputable shop. Good to know. Thanks, Chris. All right. I think I'm going to go ahead and pull out this topic. And like I said, it's one of those that will have people talking for a while. Everybody ready? How do we bring younger generations into this hobby? Anybody want to take a crack at that one? Go for it, John. Yeah, Turn off the computer. Oh, I was going to say kicking and screaming, but... Um... <laughs> Actually, you know what? It's, it's just a matter of exposure, really. That's really what it is. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's for speaking on, uh, from myself, I, 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 again, it was having a daughter who really didn't know any different, which was a real advantage. Uh, and what was really kind of cool, too, was taking her to places like uh, Ernie's uh, shop when he had it. And she saw that, you know, it was something that was okay to do and fun and. <laughs> And she was being inquisitive, she wanted to know how she could make her own cars. And that kind of, and what's really neat is it kind of snowballed into other areas of, of what she does. So anyway, I don't know if that's of any help. That, I, that yeah, was I thought, exactly what I was going to say, but the question is, how do we expose them? Steve, do you have an idea on that? Yeah, I found exposure exactly the opposite of what he just said. Um, grandkids, when they were really, really young, played with it a lot. But as they got older, discovered computers, video games, friends, et cetera, et cetera. They could care less yeah. and I've had them over with their friends I mean a lot of kids have come through here but there's no staying power it's it really I, I would disagree with that from everything I've seen and I've tried I mean, God knows I've tried <laughs> um, I just think they have gone past the electronics of slot car racing with video games in an in essence I mean, they're all online with their computer and they're playing online with each other every night. They form teams and they're on their headsets. And the graphics are stupendous and this seems like old technology to them. That's, that's what I have seen, you know. Yeah, it's um, hard to compete with that kind of technology. You know, you know, there's still a lot of, I mean, I'm talking 10, 20 kids here. I'm not talking three, you know. Right. Yeah, and, and so, of the kids that I've exposed through my slot car parties, I've I haven't had their parents calling me up saying, oh, I don't know where no. I or anything like that. So it's like, okay. exactly. I think so, I saw uh, Lloyd's hand first and I also heard Chris chime in. So let's get Lloyd and then we'll get Chris and then we'll get John. Yeah. Uh, being that I work in an odd scale anyway, I have tried over the last few years to get more people to see my tracks. So I've been doing some local exhibitions and things. If I go to a local um, exhibition, where, a crafts exhibition or so, where there's going to be children <coughs> around, the tracks go down really well. Funny enough, I find the young girls can drive the trucks a lot better than the boys. Uh, the, the, the fiddly tracks going up hills and things. Um, also, for three or four years, I did Gaydon, which you've heard of. Uh, the... Uh, slot car festival you're preaching to the converted there everybody who comes there is already interested and knows the hobby um, the idea of going to these other ones is so people see slot car racing that might they might have not ever even come across and i think that's all we got to do really is keep on out there letting people know that Look at this strange hobby. You can squeeze a button and something happens. Because although we see sets all over the place, I don't think the general public do. Yeah, and, and definitely, I mean, girls pick up, pick up the whole idea of slowing down for the turns a lot better than boys seem to do, just in general. And, and I think one of, the, one of the things with the exposure is you get a lot of people who played with it as a kid, adults who have played with the HO ones. I get that comment all the time from the parents of the kids saying, oh, I remember the little ones, but these are really cool. I'm like, yeah, here's my slot car club information. Call me, we'll, we'll race in real life, you know? So, but I think it's, I think the exposure is obviously not going to get all the kids, just because a kid comes up and has fun at the track doesn't mean they're going to 
that's going to be a lifelong hobby or that they're going to come back to it as an adult after they've done their teen years and, and young adulthood and stuff like that. I think we're, we're just hoping to catch the, the big fish that kind of gets the whole mechanical real life nature of slot cars as opposed to, you know, simulated racing and stuff like that on video games. There's, there's something about it that you just kind of like because it's real, but you've got to go through a hundred kids to find the one that, that can appreciate the realness of it. Chris, did you have something you wanted to say about this? Uh, yes. Um, overall, I'm not particularly optimistic about the future of our hobby. Um, I, I think it is, I don't think it's an exposure thing. I think as Steve said, it's a, it's a, it's technologically based and alternatives that are the real big issues. I remember when I got my first set in the early 60s, 1961, <clears throat> the year before I probably got a bag of green army men or maybe an Etch-a-Sketch for Christmas. The next year I got a slot car set that, put, that was an electronic racing controlled thing that I could alter the speed of cars as they went around the track. And then you start taking apart and, and you had to like cars and you had to be interested in it. But today, um, in a lot of the commercial places that I've helped out at or worked at, a good buddy of mine has a, another Ogilvy track in his basement. He, he, a few years ago, he had three boys. We couldn't, and the, the track was gorgeous. It was a hundred foot track in the basement. It was scenery, the cars were, everything was perfect. We couldn't pay these kids to come down and play slot cars. They're upstairs on a 60 inch flat screen playing, you know, whatever games they're playing. And I'd go up and watch and you're going, Jesus, what the hell am I doing in the basement? This is way better than what I'm doing. <laughs> but you know, the times the kids would come down, they, you know, they, the car would come off the track and they go, now what happens? Well, now you put your controller down, you walk around the track, you put the car back on, and you come back again and drive it again. And there are well, no reset buttons, no this, no that. I can't change graphics. I can't do this. I, can't. I mean, it's the cars today are no, not really any better at all than they were 50, 60 years ago. Um, yeah, they have a little more grip and some have a little bit better motors and a bit better that, but essentially they're the same thing. Um, where the alternatives to kids today are just so, so much more. Plus a video game doesn't really break down. Um, you know, you don't put it in the box after Christmas and put it in the attic. There's new games and new stuff and stuff like that. So um, anyone my opinion is anyone who thinks we can come up with a new way to get a whole bunch of kids interested, I'm not buying it. Um, and you know, you can't see my face, but my face doesn't look too much different than all the other faces out here. It's not a 20 year old face. <laughs> so anyway, done. All right. Uh, John wanted to say something and then I saw Alan's hand and Kelly's hand. So John, why don't you go ahead and chime in? I imagine ours isn't the only hobby having this challenge. I mean, how do model railroaders address this, if anyone knows? Um, and, and, you know, you've got people like Rod Stewart, uh, although that's, yeah, our generation. Uh, but, you know, they have a perception of being cool, more cool than slot cars for some reason. I don't know why, but that's, you know, anyway, the per perception. But how, how, do they, how do they address the, the issue? I think, I think in general, kids from a very young age are enamored by trains. I mean, there's very few kids out there that knows the existence of trains and doesn't think trains are cool. Thomas the Tank Engine, you know, all those the wooden train things. And so they just kind of keep going. If, if they maintain their interest in trains, they end up with electric trains. But I think, I think it's still primarily an old man hobby it's not seen as any cooler than slot cars. And I think a lot of times you have people who are into trains that don't, that aren't aware of slot cars, or at least aren't aware that they are still a thing. And then they find out about slot cars still being a thing. And they're like, oh, this is like trains, except I can actually race them. You know, they yeah, see landscape tracks and they're like, 
that's what I've been doing with my trains, but I can't race my, tra- I mean, I race my trains, but I can't actually race my trains. Right. So then they get into the slot car hobby or they have two hobbies or whatever the case may be. The, the only other in- interesting thing was that um, racers who were relatively younger, guys like, you know, Hinchcliffe and uh, they actually used to, pl- you know, play slot cars and they still know what slot cars are. Uh, but, I, you know, it might just also be just the numbers game too. Just that, you know, you introduce a hundred people to anything and, you know, maybe only one or two of them actually become actual heavy duty adopters of it could be a factor as well. And especially since it's not a fad, you know, when it first came out, it was like, wow, it's this new thing. And it just became like the biggest thing. There were slot car shops and, and you know, racetracks in every city, you know, and it was entertainment like a bowling alley or whatever. And then only the people who were really into it stuck around. So that's now we're in the post fad, you know, many, many years after the, after the fad of slot cars. And it's just the people who, found it for however they found it and, and love it enough to stick, stick with it. Alan and then Kelly and uh, Paul. Well, uh, I agree with Chris, but I think the problem goes deeper than that. Uh, I have two two children, uh, two marriages. Uh, My son is 50. Uh, My daughter is 29. Now, when I turned, the day I turned 16, I was standing at uh, the local uh, uh, motor vehicle bureau to get my learner's permit. Uh, my son was the same way. Uh, he uh, turned 16 and uh, he wanted to drive. Uh, my daughter is uh, 29 and she finally got her license after she had graduated from college. Um, I've always been fascinated by cars. I raced the real ones back in the 50s, the one the, the one-to-one ones. Uh, my son did not do that, but uh, he was very specific about uh, his first, his only, you know, his, his first real car was a Fiat uh, 124 Coupe. Uh, and he would tell anyone that uh, was willing to listen that it was very advanced because it had four-wheel disc brakes uh, a double overhead cam engine and a five-speed gearbox. Uh, Marcy likes her uh, uh, VW Golf, but for her, it's primarily an appliance. It gets her from one place to another comfortably, uh, and uh, with its various uh, functions, you know, uh, side view cameras and rear view cameras, and so on and so forth. Uh, minimizes the uh, discomfort and stress of driving. Uh, But beyond that, again, for her, it's an appliance. So I think we are seeing a difference uh, in the position and role of the automobile in society. Uh, This is percolating up to an interest in automobiles in any form whatsoever uh, and overlaps into uh, the questions of uh, uh, slot cars. So... I think I think it's a fundamental shift that we're dealing with. That is some food for thought. Thank you very much for tossing that one in, Alan. Uh, Kelly, what did you want to what did you want to say? It's pretty much with anything. I mean, you look at any of the major sports: uh, baseball, football, basketball, um, hockey, for that matter. Um, when kids were young, you went outside, you play, you played these sports, and your dream was to be a professional you know, professional athlete, but only so many was able to make that goal. Um, But it was presented to them. I mean, you have thousands of kids that have, you know, the sports presented to them. And so with that being said, it's the same with with this hobby. Um, You you may show 200 people and out of 200 people, you get one. But all it takes is one person to keep the hobby going. It doesn't take thousands it takes one person to keep it moving and so that one person shows another 200 and it takes one person and so the matter of is just you have to put seed out there for it to grow if you don't put any seed out there i don't care what you're planting it's never going to grow and i i understand where it came from how it originally started um back in the early days um even though i may look young i'm older than what i look um um, I was in the HOs as well, but 
as things evolve, I have two daughters and, and a son. My daughters enjoy the slot racing more than my son. My son can care less about slot racing, but my daughters love it. And so, and there's other um, young adults, they're young adults now, when back when I had my club, they were kids, they love it. Um, a couple of them bought their own tracks. I mean, with long story, we don't have, still don't have no clubs here, but they, 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 they enjoy racing and we get together when we can and we race still. Um, so it is possible to make it grow, but some of the spearheads and some of the knowledgeable um, people that are in, in this hobby have to educate the ones and keep pushing it, even if it's not received right away. Eventually, you will find the onesies and the twosies and the threesies that will take it and take it and run with it. It's just like, right, I mean, before we started, we were talking about 3D printing. I'm mm -hmm. like, when did you ever think that you would be able to use an instrument to pr print bodies um, for cars and chassis for cars or sceneries for your slot, slot car set? I mean, most of the time you have to go buy it or make it out of styrofoam or make it out of cardboard and paint it yourself. Now you have a device that makes that for you. So as everything evolves, the hobby will still be there. It might not be widespread as it once was, but it will still be a hobby there. I'd be surprised if it disappeared entirely. The, the hard part is, is getting to those one or 200 kids. It, it, and over time, the more, the more you try without feeling any result or benefit from doing all that exposing, the, the more downtrodden you get and, and just wait for people to come to you rather than go out there looking for people. Paul, did you want to chime in? So I would, I would actually sort of take a contrarian view. I think we're living in a golden age right now. Um, you know, you look at what happened in the 60s and everybody and their brother was down at the track and there were commercial raceways everywhere. But I think back to the 90s when I got back into this and holy cow, the, the number of parts that are available, the variety of cars that are available, the number of different track systems that are available, um, you know, it is so much better and improved now when the Fly Viper came out in the early 90s. That was a revolutionary car. When the Fly Lola T70 came out, everybody went, oh my God, somebody's really made a pretty looking car. And now you look at what's around and oh my goodness the cars are everywhere and then you know you get the opportunity to print your own so uh i i just think the opportunity is there and that's kind of what i find with my grandson is right now he's attracted by the artistic aspect of the scenery we'll go down and work on the scenery on the track great no problem with that the next thing he says is, can we build a car? Sure, I put the parts together in a kit. The next time he comes over, we assemble a car and we run it. Okay, that's great. Does he want to race for a long time? Mm, not particularly. But as long as he understands the mechanical aspects and all of those sorts of things, the next thing is 3D printing, right? What can you do with 3D printing? Well, you can do pretty much anything you want. And so now, hey, do you like that car? Do you like that airplane? Do you like that whatever? We can go ahead and make one. And I, I really think there are different ways to get people into the hobby now than there were 20 and 30 years ago. And I think there are you know, I think back to the old uh, TMAS mailing list from the <laughs> Greg Holland ran that again back in the in the 90s, I think, which at this point are 
30 years ago. So I, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about the survival, but I do really appreciate the six or seven guys that we get together on a weekly basis and race because it's really cool to have that group of people to share the hobby with. I think that makes a big difference. Otherwise, we all sort of feel like we're on an island and that's more difficult. I think one of the things that we tend to naturally do as humans is when we're when we're passionate about something, we want to share it with the world. And so then because we're passionate about that thing, we wonder why aren't more other people as passionate or even a fraction as passionate about that thing as I am. It's so cool. How can you not like it a little bit and want to come race and stuff like that? So, I mean, you made some really great points about track set availability. I mean, Slot It just came out with a whole nother <laughs> type of track for people to buy. And the rest are pretty much still all around. Lots of car manufacturers, lots of parts suppliers, a global economy where we can get pretty much whatever we want. I think maybe we're just worried about it. Um, I think I think I might have heard uh, Chris wanting to join in. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to say again after earlier? No, okay, uh, Lloyd? Yeah, um, you just uh, touched on something there. Uh, I come back into the hobby by accidentally, I was looking for photographs of the cars I used to work on, the full-size cars, and uh, I found Slot Forum. And nowadays with the forums and the Facebook groups, we are spoiled. There is an awful lot of people out there, and particularly on the Facebook groups, a lot of them are quite young. So uh, I don't think it's the end of things. I, I think it's just different. And I think we mentioned uh, last week or the week before that because of the pandemic and, and isolation orders, a lot of people are trying to find indoor hobbies and slot car is making at least a, a small resurgence as an indoor hobby. And, and like you have noticed, I've, I've noticed a lot of newbies on the various groups and forums and stuff. So yeah, yeah I mean, Definitely, that is that is happening. John, what did you want to chime in with? I was going to say, you know, we also, because of our perspective here in, in, as in our discussion, we're kind of Uber users. So uh, it's, it's, let me put it in another way. Uh, as a Canadian, we don't understand why Americans don't like hockey. And I'm sure the British don't understand why North Americans don't like real football. So it's, it's not that we're not getting exposure to it. It's not that we're trying to expose Americans to hockey. It's just that... You know, it's it's like anything else. There's a, a it takes it. Sometimes it just takes some time. I really like hockey. <laughs> Great hockey, like hockey. <laughs> Lots but, of but, friends but, I have. But, but full size, look, I can I can I can tell you categorically that full size racing is going through the very same dilemma. Quite frankly, uh, both you know everything from Formula One, IndyCar, NASCAR, like real. Never mind the grassroots guys who are, you know, they were racing to empty standing, uh, empty seats way before our pandemic. Um, it's they're, they're facing a, a very similar uh, challenge as well. Yeah, uh, hopefully things can get a little bit better for them once things start to get better for everybody. Uh, did anybody else want to chime in on this topic? Phil, did you have anything you wanted to add? <coughs> Yeah, actually, I was just going to say, you know, I, I look around at the hobby and I look at full size racing. And I, I think what we have here is just an, uh, an opportunity for automobiles. You know, even though our, our vehicles sit outdoors or in our garages, our carriage houses, what have you, we've got all these people that are embracing modeling, slot car racing. There's a huge surge in uh, sim racing. You know, people using game consoles and uh, electronic steering wheels with force feedback and pedals with force feedback on them that simulate very closely simulate driving a real car. So what I'm seeing is some interest in racing and in automobiles that I think is just, you know, we have all these dialogues going on, you know, and, and last time I was on, we even talked a bit about all the tensions and social tensions and things. But I think that same thing is happening 
you know, fortunately, you know, no one's going through the, the stress parts of what we see in the social rifts. But I think the car stuff in general is coming that way. You know, and I, I think that bodes well for our hobby. You know, the more people who enjoy sim racing, it's great, but you turn your computer, your game console off, and poof, it's gone until the next time you turn it on. You can put that slot car on your shelf, you know, all 900 of them, <laughs> if you're Ron. <laughs> Probably 912 now, right? Because it's been a week. But you do that, and, and I think that that's the cool part. Yeah, we'll, well, we'll and I think it, it we'll drives the adrenaline rush, right? That people appreciate the adrenaline rush of the video game and i'm pretty sure i'm you know among good company here that when you're pushing to beat your fast lap you kind of get that adrenaline rush from squeezing the trigger on something that pushes a little electric toy car yeah during our sprint races we do one minute and then crashers go back on we do another minute after each minute, we're like, breathe, okay, everybody breathe, because everybody's like holding their breath. Oh, come on, who, who hasn't gotten to the end of a three minute heat when you're, you know, two sections ahead of the guy behind you going, oh my God, do not wipe out on the last corner. <laughs> exactly. John, what did you want to say? I'm going to say, I, I, you know, I'm sure Elon Musk has a slot car track because listen, we are got to be one of the greenest hobbies around. I mean, just think if, if, if the automotive sector is really serious about electrification, they should really, I mean, I, I, and again, I've, I've worked in the automotive marketing field and I've been touting this to the guys and the, the kids are starting to listen. You know, if you really want to see what an electric motor can do uh, and the advantages of an electric motor, because the real stumbling block is power supply. I mean, batteries are, this, we're still a hundred years behind in battery technology, but as far as anything else, I mean, we, we've been, We've been green for you know over fifty years. Awesome, I like that take on it. Anybody else have anything? Uh, Lloyd, go ahead. Uh, I'm done now. It's okay. getting late here. Getting <laughs> late here, so I'll say good night to everybody. Okay, good, good morning. <laughs> yeah. All right, just, see you next time, Lloyd. Just a quick one on uh, the comment on the adrenaline rush. Yeah. Uh, I was at a race in the States quite a few years ago, many, 20 years ago. It was the U.S. Nationals. And they handed out T-shirts that said, they're only toy cars until you squeeze the trigger. It ain't that the truth? And then all of a sudden, the com competitive instinct kicks in. Isn't that right, Steve? No, I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then they're race cars. The when you pull the trigger, it's a race car. Yep. And, and ha having, done, ha having done this with real racers, I can tell you, uh, real racers would race refrigerators if they could get them going fast enough. All the guys in Japan race, race minivans, for heaven's sakes. They'll race anything. Yeah, yeah it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yep. Yeah. Lawnmowers. Yeah. Lawnmowers. Yeah, lawnmowers. Totally. Race. <laughs> you know, most of the slot car guys that, that have come to this track, and, and actually this track all started, are really gearheads at heart. I mean, this all started here because I moved up here from Florida, um, had my sports car. I used to race one to ones also a long time ago. I've had a lot of sports cars, and I met a number of people in different clubs that had their sports cars, and here came winter. And you kind of look at each other and go, what the F are we going to do now? It's winter. And... Wandering in a hobby shop, there was a fly model there, as Paul had mentioned. It was really pretty. I didn't know it was a slot car. I bought it. I took it home. I showed it to seven, eight guys or something. And suddenly we had a group. And that is, they were all gearheads. They all put their cars in storage and needed something to do relating to cars in the winter. Our group is really made up of guys that love cars. And slot cars are just an extension of that. I think that's why we like the scenery tracks. You know, you kind of, what do I want to say? You kind of fantasize or whatever you want to call it. You know, um, that's what our group consists of. Um, you couldn't get our guys onto like a commercial track, most of them. They would have no interest in it, but have nice looking cars that are good looking models that you're running on track and having competitive racing. And then there's the scenery there. You can kind of, you know, 
that's what kept it's kept it going up here in Minneapolis anyways far from my perspective yeah I, I've, I've described this to people as a moped hobby it's a lot of fun to do but you don't want your friends to see you while you're doing it really yeah that's it well just as a joke but honestly once real racers get a controller in their hands I, I've had guys here I had to kick them out at four in the morning yeah if I believe that yeah yeah I have a I have buddies that do that. Sorry, go ahead, Alan. Now, I, I, I tell you, uh, I'll uh, uh, want to pick up on something that uh, another one of the countervailing forces, at least from my standpoint, uh, that we are dealing with uh, is uh, some of the things that have happened in the one-to-one -one racing sphere. Now, uh, I wrote a doctoral thesis it was based heavily on uh, dealing with uh, uh, fluid uh, viscosity and fluid systems. Uh, air is just another fluid. I understand completely why aerodynamics have shaped the way cars look today. Uh, and in the perfect world of perfect aerodynamics, in point of fact, all cars would look the same. Uh, this is different from the cars of my era take any 50s automobile, uh, sports racing car, Grand Prix car, whatnot, uh, uh, spray, spray it primer gray, and I will identify it for you. Uh, the cars today, Formula One racing, I don't even bother to watch because unless I can read the driver's name or interpret the uh, advertising on the side, I don't know what the hell is going around the goddamn track. And I'm not interested. <laughs> Uh, the same thing is, is uh, impacting uh, uh, slot, uh, uh, stock car racing. I talked about this last week, about how the fact that, you know, you can no longer go to a stock car race on Saturday and then go into the dealer shop uh, on Monday and buy almost the same car. Uh, and again, I think that is uh, one of the things that is nibbling away uh, at enthusiasm for automobiles. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I will make one other comment, uh, picking up on something that was mentioned before. Certainly in terms of what is available to the slot car hobbyist today, uh, particularly with the advent of the internet, uh, the supplies, parts, bits and pieces, you know, people like me who, you know, I want a 30 uh, tooth, uh, uh, 72 pitch uh, crown gear and I can go on the net and I can find it uh, 20 years ago I get about it so uh, it's a mixture uh, it's not one side of the coin or the other uh, it's rather like a, a six-sided die from Dungeons and Dragons there are good sides and there are bad sides what about slot car aerodynamics uh, well, I'll tell you about slot car aerodynamics. Uh, I, uh, I just built my first uh, 60s uh, slot car. It was an Eagle Westlake. And I took it out to Rad Tracks uh, in Las Vegas for, I think, the second of the big conventions out there. I took it uh, on the uh, first lap around the big King track. And I got to the dead man and some dumbass was some kind of flying doorstop came down, came off with the uh, dead man, took the car off, took the driver's head off, took both exhausts off, and so on and so forth. You want to talk to me about slot car aerodynamics? You're not going to get a pleasant conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I think I think uh, Roy was. Uh... I'm sorry, Ray Carthy was uh, posing that one. I think he might have had his tongue in his cheek a little bit um, because I think most of us know that. Generally speaking, aerodynamics don't play a, a big role in slot cars, except when you get to those doorstop looking things, the wing cars with their, with their walls and whatnot, because they go so damn fast. Right. So, uh, yeah, uh, Ray, if you're not familiar with wing cars, but you said you've been around slot cars for a while. I'm sure you know what they are. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of familiar with them. I, uh, I uh, have seen the health safety trials where you can't even, you know, they're doing three second laps on a 150 foot track. <laughs> but uh, I just thought it interesting that Alan did a, um, a dissertation on 
uh, fluid dynamics and uh, it's something that's interested me also. And uh, I was wondering at what speeds, you know, it actually starts becoming important. I, uh, early on in my slot car, in my recent slot car history, I made a drag strip down one, down one hallway of my house when uh, my wife and daughter were away for a weekend. And I was running a uh, electric chaparral with a uh, spoiler that just pushed in. And every time it would get halfway down the track, no matter how tightly I pushed it in, the spoiler would fly off. <laughs> and uh, so evidently, um, you can get some aero effects going on, even at that scale. And the other thing that interests me, it's probably for another time, is uh, just the scale effects that this is a conversation we might have to have on this, the uh, scale effects that uh, at scale um, with boundary layers and uh, you know how aerodynamic scale from one one to one thirty second. Well, the, the the big issue with thirty seconds, any the big issue with slot cars is you can't scale air. Exactly. Um, you know, so you've got a, a little slot car that goes 15 feet per second, which is in the whole scheme of things, that's roughly what most of the 30 second scale home type cars do. You know, a wing that's a, a quarter inch deep and an inch and a half long is just like it, does, it doesn't make any bloody difference. Now, when you're racing wing cars and somebody set a three second lap, the current world record on a king is 1.2 seconds over 155 feet. And aerodynamics make considerably more difference because of the, you're doing 80 miles, 80 miles an hour, not 10 or 15 miles an hour. Plus the cars are so incredibly light that even light pressure has a significant significant effect on the overall uh, weight of the car. But the biggest problem, you know, guys have said, well, you know, try this, try that, try this. The biggest problem is you cannot scale air. So I would hazard a guess with your chaparral wing, there might have been a couple of, you know, less than perfectly smooth joints on the track somewhere that sort of vibrated the wing off as opposed to the, the wing coming off from, from any sort of wing pressure. That, that, that is a possibility. I ran it several times and it came off at approximately the same speed in different spots on this fairly long drag strip. So I was thinking possibly, uh, the wing wasn't modeled as a uh, inverted airfoil, but perhaps as a regular airfoil. And, and lifted itself out of the car. Yeah. Must have been pretty loose. <laughs> 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 All right, did anybody else wanna chime in on that topic? I think we're-, we're Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll just, you know, I, I think as many have said, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times in many ways, right? Um, true, we have, you know, numerous manufacturers putting out really high quality products and, you know, the, the world is at your fingertips with the, you know, the internet, you can get exposure and find things everywhere. But uh, I, I think to Alan's point much earlier, you know, car culture has changed. I mean, when I, I didn't live through it, but, you know, I've, I've seen and read about, you know, like when the Mustang was introduced and families going down to the local dealership to check out the new 58 model lineup and such. I mean, things like that just don't occur anymore. And, um, and also, uh, I think what Phil said, you know, with uh, sim racing, it's not something I have gotten into yet, but I've seen a lot of videos on it. And, you know, it's pretty amazing. You can take the car of your dreams, you know, a Porsche 917 or a Lola T70, and go race on a historic track and, and actually, you know, change that up if you want. Whereas if we want to change our track, uh, you know, it's it's not just picking from a, a pick list, it's, you know, tearing it apart and, uh, you know, spending time to reconfigure it again. So um, like many of you, I don't have the answer. I think, uh, you know, for me, my take on it is I'll do what I can. I enjoy it, it's my hobby, I have fun and, uh, I just hope the manufacturers still keep supplying me with what I need.
Keep that plastic crack coming. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you know, I find it kind of fascinating because I, you know, I have a wide spectrum of people that I socialize with and, and, uh, you know, they, they, you know, I intermingle with a, a pretty good cross section of, of society here in Southwest Michigan in terms of age groups, racial demographics, uh, socioeconomic. I mean, I've got a pretty broad spread. And what I find fascinating is a lot of people, when they come in and they see my track or they see a picture of it when I'm at work or what have you, uh, they think it's pretty neat. But I forget different parts and the different things that interest different people until I, until I hear these folks. Some of the people just want to know, how, can I how many times can I change this track? Does it break when you take it apart and put it together a lot? Because they see it like it's Legos, right? And so their interest is just, this is kind of like having the sandbox with the truck with the blade on the front, you know, and you'd push it around the sandbox and eventually you get frustrated. So you just use your hands and build your roads and then you drive your, your toy cars in the dirt. So that a lot of people are seeing that. Some people, you know, they just want to have the cars and have them sitting on a shelf. They've got a bunch of die casts sitting someplace, right? Or they want to know, is their car? available as a slot car because they really don't want a lot of slot cars. I got a guy right now owns a car dealer, small used car dealership. He's got about 400 cars on his lot at any given time. And he likes cars. And I showed him a picture and he wants me to bring him a Ford, a Ford GT, you know, GTE uh, endurance car. So I'm going to take him over a number 68 winning car. And, and he's going to think that's really cool. So you really kind of look at it and, and I'm a lot like Ryan, you know, this is my hobby. This is what I like to do, but I am a person that likes to try to, uh, what we say, assimilate other people into our collective. And uh, so I try, I'm trying now to, to broaden my view of what my hobby is because I know what, I don't really don't know what attracts me to it. You know, Mary's always asking me like, you know, I just, I've got like, I don't know, 15 slot cars that I just bought, you know, in the last 30 days. And uh, my fiance is like, you really love these things. I'm like, yeah, I really don't know what happened here. <laughs> but so, but I'm trying to change that to, to think about other people and what they do like. So when I'm talking to someone and they show a little bit of interest, I try and ask them a little more, listen to them a little more, hear what they're, in, how, what question are they asking? So I can answer the part that might help them decide, yeah, this is a pretty cool thing. And, you know, like you said, you know, I'm not any, uh, you know, I don't really evangelize slot cars, but I, I'm a pretty, pretty good enthusiast. So, but I do, I think the times are great. Yeah, I, I disagree. Steve, were you going to say something? It looks like you're ready to give us a word. No, nope. no I, knocked, I knocked my iPad down. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we're, yeah, we're coming down to half an hour, a little less than a half an hour. I wanted to touch on a topic we hit earlier before our time is up. I would like Ron and or Phil to address the topic that we had earlier. Uh, you were absent. We talked about collections and part one is how do you manage your collection? Because both of you have sizable collections. How do you <coughs> administrate your collection so that you don't rebuy or or whatever the case may be make sure you you know have what you're looking for or don't have what you know how do you administrate your collection keep track of it and then the other part is how do you display it or store it because that many cars takes up a lot of space i had to i don't even have you know a, a fraction of what you guys have and i just i got rid of all my slot car cases because they just take up so much darn space and i think ron mentioned that his under under his track is going to be storing boxes. I assume you meant slot car boxes. <laughs> Do you want to start, Ron? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so I have a, a big collection. Um, it's over 900 cars. And um, right now, I don't have the display set up that I would like. Um, we recently moved into the house where I live a little over a year and a half ago and we had an unfinished basement. So I've been working on finishing the basement so then I could build 
the tables I needed for my slot car track. And that's kind of at the point where I'm at now. So I've been storing my cars in their cases in totes. Um, I think they're 27 gallon totes. I buy them at Home Depot. They're black with the yellow lid. And they're really nice. They're very heavy duty and, and stack very well. And uh, my plan is to uh, build wooden racks that I want to hang on the walls of my basement around my track and store the cars on there. Um, I'll keep the cases because I am a collector, um, but the cases will go in, back into those totes and all those totes fit under all of my tables. So it's, uh, it's a nice way to store them. Um, and as far as inventory, um, I just use an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I have it broken out by the manufacturer and um, uh, manufacturer of the slot car, not of the actual one-to-one -one car. And um, what's nice with Excel, and I'm not an Excel wizard, but with you know the features it has, you can sort um, the data. You can see you know how many Porsches or Ferraris or Brabham's or whatever kind of car it is you want. Um, you know, and I have. I have them color coded um, for those that I own and those that I want and those that are actually in transit, either pre-order or have been ordered and haven't arrived yet. And I update that every time something comes in. In addition, what I do have is uh, also a PowerPoint uh, document that have photos of all my cars in. I take kind of a three quarter shot and a side view shot. So I get two cars on each slide. And uh, my plan is eventually when I do display them is that uh, I will go into the PowerPoint and number each car. And on the bottom of each car, before I put it on the rack, um, I'll put a, a small round sticker on the bottom part of the chassis with the number that corresponds to the PowerPoint presentation. So then I can, you know, figure out or if, heaven forbid, if someone has to clean up my estate, they can put the right cars in the right boxes. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I guess those are kind of musts. I mean, it, with a 900 car collection. Oh, Graham's showing us off his display. I think Phil's getting ready to be a show off. Graham, go ahead and tell us about your display. I want to, I want to focus on you while you speak about it. No, minor, minor die cast. I'm a NASCAR die cast nut. And so I have the room I'm in is just all NASCAR but they're all cataloged in a computer like a spreadsheet like Ron has. They're just all in a computer and um, keep track of them. I did think about putting stickers on the bottom of each one with a serial number though. <laughs> so there's, I think there's 1,500 in here. So do, so do you have that diecast collection tracked in any way or is it just up, it's just out there to be seen? No, on a spreadsheet. Okay. I know which ones I have and, uh, you know, and stuff and all of them and all the different, you know, they're all different sizes and, you know, and stuff. So, and then the ceiling, it's a, like a sloping ceiling. So they're all, the little ones are still in packages, right? You know? And then the other ones I built all the shelves for and stuff. So, but it's, uh, and, and my slot cars are all, they're up there, you know. I got about a hundred slot cars, I guess, and they're all on a separate spreadsheet as well. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Phil, did you want to tell us about your uh, slot car management? Uh, okay, I'll go ahead and make you focus here so we can see you. Talk about your collection there with your cell phone. Yeah, here. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I think we all do similar things. You know, we have these i got to take this out because I'm on the, I'm on my computer online and I'm on, um, and I'm on the, uh, the phone. So sorry guys. But you know, my point is I do the same thing. I, I have this system set up on a spreadsheet and that's my most reliable uh, method for tracking my cars and my data entry skills sometimes falter, you know, most of the stuff that I have sitting around on tables. I haven't entered yet, so they don't they don't really get, you know, picked up until I decide to put them in. And then, you know, now I'm trying to uh, actually put them all into the Magic Arc app because you can export that database 
But what then what happened is I'd have them all in at least one of my race management systems with a photo, with the car, you know, they would be calibrated and everything, which if when you race digital, you need that calibration to really make all the features work. So I've been working on that lately and I'm probably only be like 70 cars, 80 cars in because, you know, you're taking pictures, you know how it is. So if you've used that app, you, you'll you understand why it's not the best data entry process. And uh, so I'm doing that. Uh, as far as displays, uh, much like Ron, my basement was unfinished. Uh, if you look over my shoulder, you see that I-beam right there. <laughs> that's un Those are, that's nasty paint dripping and stuff. Uh, on the ceiling. So I'm still working on the basement. It's it's sort of close to done. Uh, and I've just got one display case on the wall. And then I store everything in these guys, which are about um, these you can buy in a home store, uh, like a Lowe's if you have those, or a Home Depot or Menards, or we have uh, department stores in the area called Meyer, And they sell these for about seven bucks a box. And they hold eight cars. But what's neat is if I go to a club track, I can grab a assortment of cars for the series that's being raced at night and carry them along. So that works for me. Um, I'll do a quick uh, flip around. I won't take you on a massive tour or anything. But here's my desk. Uh, food for the masses. Uh, you can see I've got some cars over here. Uh, and there are various manufacturers. I've got cars sitting on my desk. I work from home, I'm an IT guy. So this is what my desk looks like when my coworkers think uh, I'm not distracted. Uh, so that's the stuff that I carry around. You can see my track. And then this box, this display case, I've recently become fascinated with, and I just found a bunch of them online. So I think I'm gonna buy these and then uh, use those They're just uh, mirror back and so that'll give me that then back here um if you look over there there's a 50 inch monitor and those aren't really on display because uh if they were on display you would be able to actually see them behind the uh scoreboard here so that's kind of what i do um you know, and a lot of times there are cars that sit on the track, stuff like that. You see, my landscaping really sucks. That's what I was telling you about, a lack of effort. So uh, that's where that is. Quick little walk around. Thank you very much for the walk around. That was very enjoyable. And I made you big on the recording. So you should be able to, everybody should have been able to see that very well. Uh, did, Ron, did you want to address that topic anymore? Or? Anybody else want to talk about collection administration and displays in any way? John, I don't know if you have a big collection or anything. Sure. Uh, great. I was just going to say maybe, uh, I guess the next time we do the seven o'clock hour chat, maybe I'll set up in my basement and I can show you all what I was talking about. Well, th that's what I was suggesting before. I think it'd be great to see what everybody, you know, different mm -hmm. ideas and would be just wonderful to see. I love that the, the mirrored display box we just saw was awesome. I, Everybody's going to be searching online after this, I'm sure. <clears throat> yep, I put it on my topic list, so so uh, <laughs> maybe I'll 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 note that in advance if people want to make sure they're on a portable device so that they can show off their their situation. Uh, don't really have enough time for. Well, let me check my topic list. If anybody has anything they want to toss in there, I'm going to look at my topic list here. Graham, say something. You're still showing off, and I want a bigger screen. <laughs> what can I say? They're just fun stuff to collect, just like, you know, the slot cars are, you know, up over there and some more downstairs. But, you know, all this stuff is just many years of going to NASCAR races. My son and I used to collect that stuff. So, uh, you know, we kind of got it hidden. Well, not hidden. My wife never comes up in this room. She hasn't been in this room in 10 years, you know, and then the other hobby, you know. Oh, that, that's some cool vintage stuff there. Are you an audiophile? Yeah, kind of. Now, did you play music at all? No, but I play a stereo really well. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's another hobby that is, that needs a database as well for all of that stuff and Sorry, rebuilding. That, that, 
the the two tra is that a TAC by chance or Tascam? It's a Tascam. Yes. How do you know that? You're a slot oh racer. well, no, I I was a studio player for a number of years and. Yeah, I, I have a I have a recording studio at home. It's it's not too big. It's only about four hundred square feet. But oh, well, there you go. Yeah, I've got a Tascam three eighty eight that that, that okay. made. Yeah, and that paid for the the studio. <laughs> that's a B, that's a BR twenty. Nice. I have four of those. Well, I was gonna say you just ping pong, you just you know stereo uh, ping pong to each one, and you've got a multi track. Yeah. yeah, and then I have four Studers as well. Oh, you, Studers are fantastic. Then you can run those things upside down. They'll track forever. <laughs> I know. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, guys. Back, back Sorry. on cars. The same, the same audio audio file chat. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. I'm. Sorry. We can, we can talk about talk about your gear after the after the hour mark. We got 15 minutes. Well, I I'm think, gonna get myself banned. I was stalling until somebody, somebody else showed pictures of slot cars. I think Alan. Gearheads are gearheads, guys. <laughs> and it look, it looks like Ron's getting ready to show us off some stuff. Alan, did you want to say something? <laughs> yeah, uh, just a quick uh, surprise. It's surprise. Uh, contrarian view. Um, I am an anti collector. I've got probably about, uh, I don't know, uh, a dozen cars uh, like this merit bodied uh, van wall that uh, mean something to me for historical reasons. Other than that, uh, anything that I have is up for sale, up to be scavenged for parts. Uh, or simply put put at the back of the box. What I'm interested in is what I'm building now for the next race. So, Alan, you're you're essentially the Colin Chapman of slot cars. <laughs> yeah. Or, or in my case, Alan, you're the Tim Miller of slot cars. One of my best buddies and most reliable participants is a guy Tim Miller, and he's just like that. He's just whatever he's building for the re next race, he's tuning. When they're too slow, they're sold, and he's on to the next one. So I get that. Ron, are you going to show us off some things? Yeah, sure. So uh, I came down to my basement, and uh, see if I can show you this here, if it shows up. So uh, these are the totes I was talking about. And uh, I pulled the one out here, and this one uh, – is all Porsches, so I just have them just stored in there like that for now. They don't really get moved around much. Um, but again, the uh, the track is here. You can see I just kind of set it up to make sure it would work and actually fit and had everything I needed. It'll eventually get torn down and I'll do the landscaping and stuff that I need for it. But as you can see, I have a lot of wall space. For... Ron, did you model your track after anything specific? Uh, not really. Um, when I, when I kind of drew it out and designed it, I really was looking for flow more than anything else. Uh, I wanted to avoid low speed corners as much as possible. So uh, the, the lowest radius I have are radius two turns, a lot of threes and fours. And uh, I plan to have more elevation on it. Like I said, this is more a proof of concept to see that it actually worked <laughs> and uh, just kind of uh, get my juices going again because it's been a long time planning and, and thinking about and acquiring. So, um, yeah. And uh, let's see if you can see. This is my workstation, and it's kind of a mess right now because I'm moving a lot of stuff around. And you can see i got a lot of tools and future projects and some 3D printed stuff that I've played around with. And that's all 3D printed stuff in boxes that I need to paint and, you know, landscape with. So a lot of busy days ahead. Very cool. I can't wait yep. to see your, your, man cave when it's complete you know you were talking about putting a wet bar over in one corner and stuff like that that's uh yeah that's on the other side um my basement's kind of it's not really split into two parts but you come down the stairs and if you go to the left you're in the room i'm in now if you go to the right um there's a not quite the same amount of spaces in here this is about a 20 by 50 room um so yeah the other side is going to have a, a dry bar and you know place to hang out so yeah. 
nice. a lot of work ahead of me, but that's what it's all about, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Super cool. cool. Looking forward to seeing more pictures of that. Yep. And don't, don't forget to at least put some plastic on that ceiling for crying out loud. You're going to have a dust. Yeah, I know. I know. Like I say, the track will come down and probably something will go up on the ceiling. But, uh, there you go. Like I say, I had to get it up and turn a few laps just, just to get my fix, you know? Yep, absolutely. Again, thank you for sharing. I look forward to seeing it grow. Uh, we don't really have time for another topic. Did anybody have anything they wanted to circle back to or topic they wanted to, uh, maybe something a little bit short or a question answered or a little bit more about anybody here? Love well, actually, people. Go ahead, Bill. Actually, you know, one of the things about my track, and, and you, if you guys watch me on the forums, I'm always trying to solve, is I have multiple uh, race management systems. And I love the idea that you can have wireless controllers because when you have digital and you have six or eight people, you have no marshals and uh, because everyone's racing, right? So it would be great to be able to, if, if anyone's working on something where they're trying to figure out, say, how to have a 7042 that's doing all the, the, the advanced power base that where there's lots of build stuff that's already been out there. If someone was working on a way to use the lap counting electronics there just to do the, the, the sensing, and then you could have uh, an arc power base that could talk to give you wireless. That would be fantastic. I already do that in analog mode. I run the arc pros and I, I have two of them just so I can control all four lanes. And then what I do is I turn on say PC lap counter what have you, and I can run PC lap counter with my track mate infrared bridge. So that works great kind of in a hybrid mode for that, but it would, or someone knows a way to get a, a decent setup where you're, you're, if you had eight controllers or seven controllers, uh, so you'd have a spare one if they break that are wireless that are not $300 controllers. Uh, I might be willing to buy some wireless controllers for these yahoos that come over, but uh, that's one of my things. I'm also right now getting ready to buy the slotted dongle and stuff. It's actually in my card on Professor Motor, so I can start messing with that as possibly another way of getting that done. That's actually what I was going to mention. I mean, you've already got the hardware. Those ARC controllers are oxygen-capable controllers, and so yeah, yeah, you don't... Yeah. You don't even need the dongle to, to turn them into oxygen controllers. You just need your phone, but you need the right. dongle for the lap counting and stuff. So, okay. okay. Uh, the only thing that, uh, that you, I mean, in that case, you would need to, uh, you know, chip your cars for oxygen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you wanted to stick with electric digital chipped cars and, you know, you know, the only thing you want to change from what you have now is the ability to control uh, have have this have the APB the C7042 power base be your right. rate management machine because it has the the software that can that can utilize its power RCS64 yeah. and SSDC and whatnot. Yeah, there there is some chatter. One of the guys on Slot Forum, Doctor C. I don't know if you've been reading some of yep. the projects. He mentioned at some point that it's conceivable that it's that he'd be able to make a dongle. It be it basically be a slot slot it type oxygen dongle, except its purpose would be to receive the transmissions of those wireless controllers and pass that on to the software in the PC to then go out to your C seventy forty two to actually control the cars. So right. it'd be like <clears throat> wireless controllers controlling your your C seven zero four two power base, except. Instead of going directly to the power base like the ARC does, it'd be going through the computer. Go through the computer. The, yeah, that'd it, be pretty cool. I mean, if if the hardware would be very fairly simple, it would be a compatible chip. Yeah. And maybe an Arduino or something like that, or even a, a purpose-made you know chip to to do. Yeah, yeah. But then yeah. the software would have to be made to listen for those controller inputs. So the yeah. Software would have to be developed, and both SSDC and RCS64 are no longer in development. Right. And so we'd need we'd need PC Lap Counter to be willing to add something like that. And he said he doesn't really have any interest in doing ARC support, so I don't know if that would 
mean that yeah. controller yeah. input as well, or or if he just doesn't want to do the Bluetooth, you know, to the power base thing, I could see yeah. him being, you know, one way or the other for both of those. But yeah. there's also um, the the true speed isn't three hundred dollar controllers, you know, they're you know seventy five eighty dollars per controller, and then the the box that you plug into the power base is uh, I forget how much it was seventy eighty dollars. Okay, um, so that's pretty reasonable. That's very most, reasonable. Yeah, I have to look them up. I I got on to look for them, and it was like at the point I got on their site, it looked like they had nothing available. You know, I was going, okay, what's the deal? Are they still around? Are they not around? Yeah, he's a he's a he's a garage shop guy. You know, he he builds the stuff. Yeah. You know, he he sends, you know, gets printed circuit boards, and then he builds everything. You know, himself. Sure. I think okay. he recently went through uh, some moving situation where he had to shut his shop down for a while and then okay. get it, get resituated and start getting supplies in and stuff like that. Okay. I think okay. he's on the tail end of that process. So he, he should yeah. be amenable to communication from customers. Sure. So okay. if you're interested in that solution, I would definitely send him an yeah, email abs- saying, hey, I want to get some of these controllers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so we I think them. I will. I'll hop back on that on true speed and and at least send them a message again and go, Hey, I'm, I'm looking for some of these and uh, that'd be nice to get. Yeah. So we, thanks man. Appreciate that. The, the digital club here, uh, draw is we still use those controllers, you know, in spite of the availability of things like a slotted controller and now with the arc power bases and their controllers, we, most of us have the C7042 base. We, we wanted better controllers than the SSD controllers. We ended up getting wired true speeds and we loved them so much that when the wireless option came out, we just did a group buy and, and basically all got a, a wireless controller or two. It's real nice to just flip on Sweet. that controller, make sure the blue lights are both on and start racing. Boom. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Definitely recommend those if, you, if you're able okay, to. Okay, cool. Your Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, did anybody else have any last minute things or questions? We've only got a couple minutes left or I can end early if we're all done. You guys can just chit chat. Yeah, go ahead. Can I just say as a noob, uh, this has really been very, very enjoyable. I can't believe the two hours went by so fast. Thank you so very much for, for doing this, Greg. Thank you. you Thanks, have to, Greg. I have to watch the clock because we can chit chat for so long and there'll probably be some of these guys hanging around for another hour or two after this. So I have to watch the clock and then hit the stop button just so that everybody has the opportunity to, to, to shut it off and not feel bad about it. <laughs> Plus my wife's going to be home in five minutes. I got to cook. I got to go cook dinner. So anybody else have anything they want to join in with? Graham, did you have something you wanted to say? Nope. Just thanks very much. It's uh, I always enjoy this. That, that digital talk. I'm an analog guy. Eh? It's kind of like driving a, you know, a 1975 Corvette versus a 2017, you know? Yep. Well, I I thank everybody for attending and we're going to go ahead and stop the recording. But like I said, feel free to hang around and chit chat about other things. So to everybody watching online, thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Bye.